Welcome to Tom Talks. On this week's episode, we're going to be talking about... Surf's up, DF Double Dudes. Is Fort Worth ISD collapsing? The AI uprising is starting here. Are we in a low-income housing crisis? And who wants to watch a surveyor get fired? Hey, y'all. Welcome to the show. My name is Tom Jung. I'm your host. And I'm Jack Lizenby, co-host. And we're your local Dallas-Fort Worth real estate agents. So if you're looking to buy or sell, we'd love to chat with you. You can find... Uh, Find a link if you're watching this on YouTube, or you can find us at TomsTexasRealty.com, on Facebook and Instagram at TomsTexasRealty, and TikTok at Tom.Thanks. I don't know. <laughs> I'm still like, why did I do that? Um, but yeah, have a good weekend. Do some yeah. cool shit. Uh, it was very eventful. Uh, actually, on, I believe it was Friday, we went to a trampoline park. Oh, nice. Uh, me and a couple of friends, and that was interesting. Sober or? Very sober. There were children everywhere. I wasn't about to risk <laughs> anything. Uh, okay. You know, being a, a 30-year-old man at a yeah. place filled with kids, people look at you kind of weird if you don't bring some in tow as well. Yeah. Were you just like, oh, mine's over there. Don't worry yeah, about yeah, it. Don't, yeah, it's somewhere. No, no, no one got near me. They were, they were scared I was going to accidentally jump on them. That would make sense. Yeah. <laughs> but it was pretty cool. Yeah, it definitely reminded me of how out of shape I am. Mm. <laughs> makes sense. I went and saw... Um, Kevin Hart in Vegas this past weekend. Oh, yeah? Yeah, and uh, it was a good show. Unfortunately, I saw him when he was in Dallas, mm -hmm. so it was, like, the exact same show. But it was really interesting to see, like, his, all of his material was way more polished than the first time I saw him. Yeah, I was going to say, if he's doing it in Vegas, he's got to be top yeah. notch. <laughs> so that was kind of interesting. So I'm sure, like, you know, in another six months, that same show will come out on a Netflix special or something. <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, Anyways, uh, what are we kicking it off with today? So the first thing we're going to start off with, there's a uh, new development going up in the colony. I know we had talked about something like this before. I don't know if mm -hmm. it was on the podcast or not, but uh, artificial surfing. Yes, we uh, or artificial I looked into waves. putting it into my backyard. That's right, yeah. Very expensive. <laughs> Very expensive. <laughs> we, we talked over designs and stuff like we knew what we were talking about. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But um, so they're, they're looking to bring... Uh, the the wonders of surfing to a landlocked city okay and uh what, the way they plan to do that is an entire new amusement center it's going in next to a go-kart center off of grand view i believe is the name of the road or okay. grand something um but it's right up in the colony it costs about four million dollars and its centerpiece is a customizable uh standing wave and for anyone who may have missed the previous section, it's basically a, a, a wave that's generated to stay stationary so you can surf on it indoors or in a controlled setting. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So they're able to customize it all the way up. To, it's, it's supposed to um, replicate deep water waves. So they're able to customize it up to six feet high for anyone who's just starting all the way up to like the intermediates even. Okay. Yeah. And so this isn't the only thing it's got. Luckily, it's going to they're trying to make it a uh, a big hangout center as well. So it's got a balcony with like a bar and restaurants and stuff like that. So you can watch people wipe out okay. while you're having drinks. Dude, that's part of that's I was a, like that sounds the like, best part. Yeah. I was like that sounds like some great great people watching, maybe a date idea, yeah. something like that. You take a girl there and be like, "Man, look how much that guy ate crap right there on that yeah. wave." Yeah. <laughs> you could you could sit there and bet on the people coming up like, "Oh, oh based on that guy, there's no way he stands up for yeah. more than 10 <laughs> seconds." You know. Uh, but yeah, they've got trainers and coaches on staff, and they also offer um, equipment as well as alternatives. So if you're not good at surfing and you just want to do like bodyboarding or something like that, that's also an option. That's cool. There's um, uh, one of the guys at the poker night the other day was telling me how I think one of their companies bought a uh, sandbar over in Dallas, mm -hmm. which uh, I only know this place exists because my wife plays volleyball. Mm -hmm. And so anybody that's in the volleyball community knows about it. But because uh, it has like... Uh, I want to say it's got like 10 or 12 courts. So it's like a lot. Yeah. 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 It's a big place to go and play. But anyways, um, apparently they're taking it over, they're redoing it and they're putting one in there as well. So I'm guessing they're, they're going to take half the courts away, put, put it on one side. Mm -hmm. I mean, it kind of makes sense to play volleyball, you know, surf yeah, a little bit. Right. Like, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, like it. beach and, and sand and surf. Yeah. But, um, and then did we talk about just on this topic? Uh, I can't remember if we had talked about this on the pod or if it was somewhere else, but there's a, uh, they're trying to get a theme park up in Frisco. Yes. It's, um, did you tell me that? I don't know if we talked about it on here. We might have to do a video, uh, a section about it if we didn't, but okay. yeah, it's going to be this huge master plan development. They're going to, it's centered around, um, a theme park, which is supposed to be more like a resort style. So it's going to have all 
sorts of like hotels and okay. restaurants. It's like a giant campus, but okay. they're kind of developing a, a, a lot of housing in that area as well, just kind of radiating out from that point. And it sounds like it's supposed to be smaller than uh, Six Flags, so it's not going to be like a big mm-hmm. rival to it. But I'm sure Six Flags isn't too thrilled. Right. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Especially that close. Yeah. Um, well, another thing that uh, folks aren't thrilled about if they're in the Fort Worth ISD, or if that's our employer, is the job <laughs> cuts that are coming. Uh, and I spent way too much going, way too much time going down this rabbit hole. It'd be great, actually. I feel like on this would be great if we had somebody that like knew all this stuff to come in mm-hmm. for a uh, for like a I don't know a different different type of pod, I guess, than we normally do. Okay. Um, is that a call out? Should we? Yeah. If anybody, <laughs> if anybody wants to join us and talk schools, cause it's something that's very interesting to me, but like the further I got into it, mm. like the more there was of everything. And I was like, this is all very, there's a lot to it. But anyways, so Fort Worth ISD has a $80 million deficit right now, okay, which is a result of a couple of things. And I couldn't quite figure all of this out exactly because a lot of people were complaining about uh, school funding being cut by mm-hmm. the state. And this was something Betsy Price brought up um, you know, a month or two ago when we had our lunch in. And I couldn't figure out exactly why. There are a couple, because there was a bill that Abbott passed like four or five years ago that was, that was supposed to help increase. Right. Um, yeah, that seems to be the, like, the public push. Yeah, so what I could find, well, there's two things. One was attendance. So a lot of the funds were based on attendance, and of course we had COVID. Mm. So like I was reading this one article and it was like there, you know, the year before they had a 94% attendance record, then it went down to 91 and at 91, they lost $6.7 million in one year. Wow. Right. That's yeah. That's a small percentage. <clears throat> and I never thought about this, but like everybody pushed attendance when I was in school and I, I was just like, okay. Whatever. Yeah. I guess that makes sense. Cause if you don't have kids showing up, they're not going to, they're not going to, yeah, they're not going to learn fund right? you for it. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, I never knew it was tied to funding as well, which kind of makes sense that it is. But anyways, uh, so that was one thing. And then enrollment is the other. Mm-hmm. And, uh, what was really interesting was the amount of students that have dropped off over the last couple of years. Like it's in Fort Worth, it's dropped 14,000 students. Yeah, I was going to say with the advent of like uh, after the coronavirus and everything where they were requiring mandatory vaccinations and stuff, a lot of people were just taking it upon themselves to take their kids out of public schooling. Well, so I'm sure that didn't help anything either. It didn't help, but it was already dropping before that, Oh wow! which was interesting because we have so many people moving here, right? Right. So you yeah. think it would be increasing, but I think a big cause of this is all the charter schools that have now started up here in the area. And so they are, which, you know, this... It sucks, but it's kind of good at the same time, Mm -hmm. right? It's part of that process of improvement. Yeah, it's holding their feet to the flame. Yeah, but I was reading, as I was reading through this one article, it was talking about, um, they talked about a test, or uh, uh, they talked about, uh, it's called CCMR. I think it stands for Career College Military Readiness. Oh, yeah. So it's like something the state puts out. It's like how they, um, I guess, test and figure out if, if, you know, kids are ready to go into the real world, I guess. Right. And so anyways, <clears throat> there's different segments of it. And one of it is the ACT SAT test. And basically in Fort Worth, they had set a goal last year of getting 25% of their students to pass it, which that's it. <laughs> exactly. I'm <laughs> to like, pass it? I'm like, okay, well, here's the problem right here. Like who's setting these goals? Because you're setting such low expectations for everybody that like, you know, it just like, first of all, there's a mindset issue if that's what we're doing. Right. And so the results came in and mm-hmm. about 13% passed. Yikes. Yeah. Well, and- that's actually about in line with what average literacy rate is to be fully literate. Only about 11% actually meet it. Well, so, okay, yeah. So I did a little bit more digging because I was like, I don't know if this is good or bad. Like, mm-hmm. like how, like, is 25% normal? Is that like they're trying to get to the average? And I couldn't find those numbers. Like, it was, and this was like the rabbit hole. I was trying to figure mm-hmm. all this out. But basically, I was trying to compare. I was like, you know what? Everybody wants to be in Keller ISD. So how did they score? So I looked up just one, one of the tests, which is the SAT, mm-hmm. and they score it on 1,600 points total. So what the state is hoping that you get to is 1020, which is the state average, right? And that's what they were falling short of. They only uh, 13% of their kids made that 1020 or above, right? Gotcha. So, um, and then... Is that of the ones that tested or in total? I think... Because I never took the SAT. 
Great question. Yeah. See, that's not, why not I'm, high I'm school, yeah, that's what I'm saying. I'm missing like there wasn't apples to apples data, mm-hmm. and so I'm trying to piece all of this together. And so it's probably of the ones that took it because mm. obviously they can't. Right. They yeah. I just figured that'd be a really skewed statistic if only the from the ones that took it based off of the whole student body. Right. And so I looked up Keller and Keller last year scored 161 points higher than the state average on okay. average. So their average kid is scoring higher than the state average, which makes me think that the percentage of people that took it over in Keller, it's gotta be way, it's gotta be way higher. It's gotta be like 70 or 80%. Yeah, looking at that, know, that school district, that wouldn't surprise me, honestly. Yeah, and so there's this huge discrepancy. And um, so basically, you know, students are dropping like flies going to these charter schools, which then I was like, okay, well, is mm-hmm. charter schools, do they actually perform better? And they do. There was a study put out in 2020 by the, the state government. And basically the, the CCMR, uh, overall scores were like four percent higher at charter schools compared to the, you know, the state schools. So that's not bad. No, so it's definitely. I mean, and that's just one metric, right? But right. It, especially it's, when you're looking at twenty five percent as a margin, yeah, like four percent's a lot. Yeah. So, anyways, it's really interesting. But I think um, you know a lot of it's probably leadership and vision in the school district, and then. Mm-hmm. You know, there's it's such a big thing and there's so many yeah and they've got a lot coming their way too because I've been reading um, and it's kind of been a bit of a hot topic recently there's articles coming out of a proposed bill that would basically take public school funding and reallocate it to people so they can use it for private school funding essentially if mm-hmm. their school district doesn't hold uphold a certain standard in their area and so like Basically, if your school sucks and it doesn't meet a certain criteria, you can take your kid out, take whatever tax money you're paying into that school and get it reallocated so that way you can fund charter schools, private schools, home schools, something like that, like alternative schooling methods. I think that's great. Yeah. And it's it's I know a lot of people are probably freaking out, like, what about the small schools and small school districts? So it's specifically meant to target uh, uh, schools with more than 20,000 school districts with more than 20,000 students in them. So it's going to hit the big ones like Arlington, Dallas, uh, Fort Worth and Louisville ISD. It's not going to be hitting like Benbrook or anything like, right. That makes sense. Uh, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. I think it's, yeah, it needs to happen. I mean, education is like the biggest thing for pushing our country forward. Mm -hmm. And so, (laughs) The fact that we're <laughs> that far behind. <laughs> yeah, far behind, underfunding. It's not, yeah. So anyways, it's a, it's a mess. Any, long story short, uh, there's not as many kids anymore, so there doesn't need to be as many staff. And they Fair don't enough. have the money for it, so that's why the job cuts are coming. <laughs> I don't think they've made it official, but it sounds like they're downsizing by like 27%. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's crazy. That's more than Google. Yeah. And I was like. <laughs> yeah. It's a big cut. So anyways, that's all I got on that. Man, well, I... <laughs> Hopefully they find a way to effectively fill those gaps. Otherwise, AI is going to end up taking over that too. Mm, yeah, yeah, and because uh, they've already taken over a lot of a lot of um, business sectors, especially we have one here in Texas out of Addison, a little analytics company. I shouldn't say little, an analytics company named Lone Star Analysis actually devi- developed a hybrid AI system that's. Uh, revolutionizing the way that business decisions are being made, especially for these large multifaceted companies. Hmm. Uh, most notably, they made a recent headway with oil and gas. And a lot of oil and gas is conjecture because they, whenever they go out there and they they test a site or something like that, they don't know exactly how probable uh, a drill will be or how much it will be able to bring out. Mm-hmm. They only have projections. But what this what this program so far that they've put together has been able to do is actually on one belt, one well out in the, the Bakken Shale play, um, they ended up getting about $1.3 million more out of the well using this algorithm than they would have originally with their, their experts. Huh. So it's basically what they're hoping to do is develop a tool that can help uh, business owners make more smart decisions in all sectors of their business. It learns, it it's trained off of um, experts in the field and then makes the best decisions for that field so it can better inform the decision makers. Because um, it can be really hard to compile a lot of that data in something palatable for any one person who may not be right. an expert in that field. But I think it's really interesting because like right now, while they may be working on like submersible oil pumps and electronics, the the technology is just really exploding right now with the advent of how much horsepower we're putting into even like consumer grade 
co computational units like the CPUs of today, it it would just dwarf anything anyone could have even imagined ten years ago. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's really cool as a concept too because I, I was sitting down and talking with somebody about this, uh, one of my buddies, and I, it's it's fascinating because they've recently come out with, and I'm sure people have heard these words coming around, stable diffusion. There's okay. a company called Runway. They are in the consumer and entertainment side of uh, AI and uh, image deep image learning. And they developed a program called Stable Diffusion. And what it is is it's basically, uh, it's sort of like chat GPT, but with pictures. Okay. I mean, it has it has uh, text capabilities as well. I believe they actually worked with uh, some of the developers on chat GPT originally. But um, Stable Diffusion, you can basically type in keywords and influence the AI to create something semblance of an something semblant of an image and then sort of whittle it to a more more visually appealing design afterwards which okay. is really cool and um, it, it's it's kind of become an issue with artists and they're like oh we're gonna be phased out and stuff like this and like I get right. that but I, I'm looking more at like a uh, at, um, at an analytic standpoint, because it's fascinating the fact that they basically took this tool, this insane tool, and then just opened it up to the public. They're like, hey, go hog wild. And right. people have been making everything from like, from like these crazy fantasy landscapes all the way to like the weirdest porn you can imagine. Like it's just everything in between. And even, um, even things like equations and, and we were talking about programming the other day. Mm -hmm. And what I think people don't realize is they're feeding all this analytics back to them. They're basically paying to have somebody take their data and right. use it for research purposes. Right. So I'm I'm just like because we we think about like whenever movie companies they go and they build a um they build a movie they're going off of like past experiences uh, and market research that they had to do ahead of time, which is insanely expensive and may not necessarily hit the mark. Whereas with this, if they just look at the prompts and things that people are putting in there to generate the type of images and, and uh, products they want to see, they can know for certain what's going to be the highest probability. So if a movie company were to look at the data on something like this and be like, oh, people want a lot of cartoon cats like playing violin or something like that. Right. Hey, let's make a movie about it. Right. Oh, Screw yeah. it. Yeah. No, dude. Like, yeah. The and and the yeah. You're just making it smarter every time, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's not it's not the some somebody behind it like looking at the data. Mm -hmm. The program's looking at the data. Yeah. It basically right? builds its own bot to be like, yeah, that's good, or no, that's not. Yeah. But it's interesting with the um uh, the the pictures that it's creating and how different creative artists are getting upset about it, mm -hmm. which is an interesting kind of philosophical thing, right? Because it's taking influences from all of these artists mm -hmm. over time, and that's how it's learned to create its own, which I argue, the counter argue to that, okay. is that's how you create your art. I mean, you that, have influences from everywhere else, That's right? where parody law comes in, though. Like we have we have laws that specifically protect parody artists like Weird Al or or like mm. people who write comics and caricatures and stuff like that. It helps protect them in the spirit of free speech as well. But I have a feeling we're going to see a lot of legislation surrounding this. That's I just thought good. it was really interesting as a concept, and that was a good example. Yeah. But that that situation applies to everything. So like the oil and gas companies we were talking about earlier, this AI is learning and bettering itself so it can be a better product for mm -hmm. other oil and gas companies. You know, the other thing that's interesting, I looked into this a while back, I don't remember why, but like if you if you wanna invest in like an oil and gas well, mm -hmm. basically in a nutshell, basically somebody goes, hey, I think w there's oil over here and they get a bunch of investors together, they put up a rig and they drill and if it's there, everybody makes a lot of money. If it's not, they're like, oh, sorry. Oh, well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but if you wanna put more money in, we'll go try over here. Mm -hmm. And I was like, how do they not have good enough technology now that they just like go run something across the ground and be like, it's right there. But surprisingly, it's, there's- so There's a lot that goes into soil density sciences. Yeah, but yeah. there's not just like a laser that you shoot down and be like, yep, it's there. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was just surprised that that doesn't exist, but yeah, no, it's it's crazy. I've been following on a, on a tangent. I've been following this guy on YouTube, Practical Engineering. Mm -hmm. um, he goes over a lot of that stuff, and it's it's insanely good. If you're like a if you're like an engineering nerd at all, this is the guy to watch. Good production okay. value videos, okay. great B roll footage. He goes over some really cool topics, like the failure of the the dam that happened up in Northern America earlier this last year. Dam um, or train? There was a, well, there was that too. He hasn't covered that. He did okay. cover the, he did cover the power outage from 2021 and everything. Okay. Like, 
it, it's really good content. So okay. he might have some answers for that. <laughs> Speaking of science, uh, did you see that the um, uh, they so there's a guy that published a paper on basically um, uh, what do you call it when you can conduct without losing any power? Um, like oh, electricity. Oh, like uh, uh, infinite motion devices or infinite um, perpetual motion devices, perpetual energy devices. Uh, no, it's not not so much a device, but like right now, like if you if you want to transfer um, electricity from one place to to another with mm -hmm. zero loss, the only way to do it is to, I, I think, make it so cold for some reason. Like if it, if it's absolute zero. Like superconducting? Yes. Okay. Superconducting. That's yeah. what I was looking for. Yeah. Um, anyways, this guy, basically the issue has been superconducting at uh, room temperature, right? Because yeah, it takes an insane amount of energy. Yeah. yeah. So anyways, this guy basically published a paper that um, said that he, while it's not room temperature, it's mm -hmm. way closer and more feasible to being something that could be put into production so that'd be pretty cool yeah but anyways i was i was listening to it and apparently he published a paper like years earlier and everybody tried replicating and they're like uh, this doesn't work oh yeah i think he did tell me about that so he's trying again to see if he can like get it get the ball rolling again. yeah so maybe it's true but okay. it's, it's, it's interesting cool. yeah that, i mean <laughs> there, there would be a huge change in everything like if that could happen because mm. then all of your processing goes way up right if you're not losing en energy it's not overheating your processor all that kind of stuff mm -hmm. so anyways um <laughs> boy that was a tangent uh <laughs> yeah well one of the things that that probably wouldn't change is our housing problem mm -hmm. that we have and i'm talking about low income housing so this is um this is something i mean i guess kind of in the back of my head i'm like yeah it's kind of an issue because house prices have gone up so much here over the last couple of years. Yeah, low income is definitely a matter of opinion now. <laughs> yeah, and actually I saw, I saw this was on Google, so it's probably not true or true, I don't know. <laughs> uh, it said that the low income housing is defined as um, using 30% or less, 30% or more of your income for housing. I think 30% or more, that makes more yeah. sense. Uh, I don't know, it didn't make sense. I. I mean, if you, isn't that like the standard, like a third of your paycheck that's, yeah, or less? Yeah, that's, that's supposed to be what the standard is. I'm, I thought I'm, it was. Yeah, I'm guessing maybe they're going off like, the only thing I think, like, maybe if it's like off the like hmm. average household income, if you got to spend more than that, I don't know. Actually, I don't know what it means now that I'm just talking about it. I'm just rambling. <laughs> I mean, I guess it makes sense because like Habitat for Humanity has a threshold where it's like if it's less than 30%, you don't qualify for a lot of their programs. If it's less than 30%? Of your monthly income, yeah. Oh, the how much you're paying, how much you would be yeah, paying. Yeah, sorry. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, all right, yeah, let's go with that. So <laughs> anyways, issue is, uh, as prices have gone up, mm -hmm. like you, it is extremely difficult to find a house under 250000 nowadays, which yes. is crazy. My first house that I bought, oh man, over 10 years ago, golly, I'm old. Uh, <laughs> I feel like 127000 for it. Man, back when the rainbow was in black and white and gas cost a nickel. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so anyways, uh, I, so I ran the numbers. So last month, uh, it was like 3.4% of our inventory was $200,000 or less. Like that's nothing, right? Yeah. That's 41 houses. Wow. Yeah. And more than likely they're going to be tiny and crappy. Mm -hmm. yeah, so like 600 square feet. Yeah. And so th that's the, and that's kind of the rub. Like if you're buying a $200,000 house today with 7% interest and you know, uh, property taxes have gone up. Mm -hmm. They haven't gone up. They they've stayed the same, but the value of homes has gone up. So you're paying more, right? To, right. Yeah. So, clarification there. Um, insurance has gone up because of all the crap that's happened over the last few years. Mm -hmm. And so, anyways, I I just ran some quick numbers. If you're putting five percent down on two hundred thousand dollars house, you're paying over two thousand dollars a month. Yikes. Yeah. And then two hundred fifty thousand, you're paying over twenty four hundred dollars a month. So, if you do the math on it, it's basically for like two hundred fifty thousand, which is like, and that is not a big portion of our market. Mm -hmm. Like that's seven percent of homes available are two hundred fifty thousand or below. So that's like still tiny, and you're paying over twenty four hundred dollars a month. And that would mean for that to be 30% or 33% of your income, following the math on that, mm -hmm. you would need to make $84,000 a year. So the average income is 71. So there's, right. there's definitely a gap. Like we're getting to this point where the numbers aren't making sense anymore. And so anyways, 
Um, Fort Worth realizes this, and they're looking for a solution, but they don't have one. So, yeah, and see that that comes at a really bad time because I actually saw an article that I was thinking of making one of the topics, mm-hmm. but um, there's been a huge decline in built permits coming into the city city count city uh, hall. Yes. So new homes, while they've been a great haven for stuff like this with their financing options, yeah. um, it may not be there for very long. And we talked about this, I don't know, three or four weeks ago mm-hmm. after I went to that uh, economic forecast thing. Because builders, builders are looking at everything and they're going, whoa, yeah. we way overbuilt. And then so they're trying to find that equilibrium. So, they, yeah, they really slowed down. But we're – Fort Worth, they estimate that we're about 20,000 houses short of a lot. what we need. Yeah, that is a ton. And so – uh, anyways, I figured we could talk about possible solutions today Okay. Uh, to this. And the first solution that when I just Googled, mm. uh, the the most prevalent solution is like one that just really irritates me quite a bit, which is like government help. Yeah. And I'm like, that's you're, you're treating the symptoms, not the problem, right? Right, yeah. And so there's all, I don't really want to get into that one, but there's all sorts <laughs> of ways to do it. Tax breaks, you could do well, uh, I- subsidies. I know a lot of uh, a lot of higher density areas have been looking at well higher density housing mm-hmm. um, like economy units and stuff like that like yes. garden homes and communities yeah. and uh, obviously there's things like apartments and condos yeah. uh, which are more cost effective for projects while still being um, something that people can afford and I think that 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 was one on my list I think that's a really good idea and um, so well I guess a couple of things so one is like. There are companies out there now that are tackling the solution uh, with prefabricated uh, multifamily mm-hmm. places. There's a company called IndieWell, and they're out of California, and they're helping address it out there. So I, I didn't I didn't try to find numbers on it because I'm like, whatever the numbers are there, it's not going to apply over here, yeah. I feel like. But um, which all said that led me down another apple hole. So I'm going to explain the difference between a modular, a prefab, and a manufactured home because okay. a lot of times in my head they all run together. Right. You hear one and your brain's just like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so a modular home is a house that is pre-built, mm-hmm. and they basically come out and install it on a, a slab or a foundation. Okay. And it's – it's um, in Texas, it's built to, like if you were just building from the ground up, same codes. A manufactured home is what we call a mobile home or a trailer home. Mm-hmm. And that's where they come out and a lot of times they'll just set it on bricks or whatever. It's considered personal property unless you strap it down in a certain way, then you can get it yeah, classified as permanently attached home. to the the ground itself yeah, essentially which i've seen it and i'm like you just put like a couple of metal straps on there i'm yeah, not sure i'm, like, I'm gonna be it's perfectly still on cinder balls. yeah i'm gonna be perfectly <laughs> honest if they just put it on the ground even if it wasn't attached to the land it's not going anywhere i consider that pretty permanent that's, very, that's true <laughs> uh and then prefab fabricated which i think is probably going to be the future of a lot of a lot of different builds but this is where they basically manufacture everything in a plant and mm-hmm. they do it like wall by wall so they get out there and a couple guys like mm-hmm. you know pick up the wall and put in some anchors or whatever and then you go to the next wall so they yeah. build it on site you know they finish the build on site but it's free prefabricated um and so i thought it was really interesting the indie well company they were doing this with like four-story buildings mm-hmm. and uh, they do it very quickly too and the cost is a lot lower. So, like right now, I think, um, and this is this all depends on finish out. But like I know, here in Texas in our area, if you're building a house, like builder costs, depending on finish outs, probably somewhere between a hundred on the very very cheap end to a hundred and probably forty dollars a foot, and that's for like the entire area under under the roof mm-hmm. so that's your your porches your garage all that um and i believe with the prefabrication they can get it down to where it's like 75 dollars a foot wow right so yeah there's a lot of cost savings there now at the same time you're not going to get these huge bedrooms and all this mm-hmm. other stuff right because you're going to be constrained to whatever they can build in the the manufacturing plant 
Well, not just that, but what will fit on a truck. Also, you know? yes, that's a good point. <laughs> you you didn't there. think about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think that's probably the biggest constraint. So, uh, so anyways, but uh, I, I could see that being a possible solution, at least getting like some lower cost, more dense mm -hmm. stuff in to, to provide solution. So I know that you actually have started doing that with a lot of high-rise hotels. Um, they basically manufacture a unit, break it down, ship it, and then they rebuild the unit in the structure itself. So uh, we're seeing that with a lot of the newer ones. There's a really famous one actually out in San Antonio off of the river walk. Hmm. Um, I forget the name of it, but they, they make sure to point it out if you ever take the, the boat tour through okay. there. Very cool. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think, there's, I think there's a lot of opportunity there because, I mean, the, especially like if you have it, hate to say this, but like if you have it manufactured in like Mexico, mm -hmm. where labor is way cheaper, like you're gonna save on labor as well as material. But um, yeah. so anyways, that's one. The other I was thinking about is like, what if what if you have like a different living situation than normal? Okay. And this is something that I saw when I was visiting Europe, um, where they had like, it was almost like apartments, but they had a common uh, living room and kitchen. Oh yeah, like um, almost like a dorm setup. Yeah, and I thought that was kind of neat because like everybody's got, and I don't know, they may have had their own like little mm -hmm. living space or I'm, I'm guessing like it was kind of like a studio or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there was like this big main area, and I thought you know that that would be kind of cool in certain situations, like um, you know if if I didn't have kids mm -hmm. and, or maybe even if it was like, hey, everybody that lives in this building are entrepreneurs or mm -hmm. they're all, you know, nurses or whatever, like, and and so maybe you have these type of setups with like a big garden in the middle yeah. where people hang out at and that kind of thing. I mean, that's that's always been like, I, I think it's a cool idea, especially for um, like younger single people because they usually have a little bit more expendable income that they can spend on themselves. So they mm -hmm. may not cook as much. There may not be as much high right. traffic area in those common areas. Uh, but they, whenever they get off work, which is usually their main focus because, you know, less likely to have kids and stuff like that. Right. They just go hang out in the rooms like yeah, it, it's it's very it's very efficiency based and it saves the the designer a lot of space trying to implement those common area things in each room. Right. Because the kitchen is one of the most expensive things. Of a yes. House, so, you know, very. Um, but, you know, you get to that issue where it's like, well, when you have kids and everything else, like, you know, how do how do you go through the process of figuring out who your neighbor is? Because you don't mm -hmm. want, you know. You right, know. you don't want to be sharing a kitchen with somebody who leaves trash everywhere. Yeah, or somebody that's sketchy or, you mm -hmm. know, whatever it is. So it's like, they're, they're, you know, there's some other issues there. But I think, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of benefits to it as well. But so maybe that's a possible solution. Uh, the other uh, the other one, I think, is increase in wages. Mm -hmm. And this is something that I think you know, we could start today, which is, I feel like a lot of times, you know, um, and I've talked to people, they're like, I only make this much money. Mm -hmm. And so in my head, being an entrepreneur, I'm like, we'll learn another skill that you can make more money at. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, like monetize your, your, uh, your talents. Yeah. And so, but you know, it's, it's, you know, I've, I've said this since I read rich dad, poor dad. Uh, <laughs> but basically like if, if people don't know how to get from A to B, like mm -hmm. if they don't see the path and know how to walk down the path, it, it's, you know, they got to have a lot of willpower to get there. Mm -hmm. But if you can go in and teach a class and say, hey, here's some ideas, is, you know, and, and almost have like a, a mentoring program right. on, you know, figuring out what's another avenue or whatever, then all of a sudden, you know, you see that path. Uh, where before it's like I'm just stuck in this hopeless situation. Right, that that overwhelm because all they see is where they are, where they're going, and every variable in between. They don't right. see like how they can take advantage of each little step along the way. Mm -hmm. And once you see that path, then you know hanging on to your thirteen dollar an hour mm -hmm. job or whatever is no longer that important. And then right. <laughs> eventually, that that business is going to raise wages. You know, so. Mm -hmm. I don't know. So I feel like that's something that we should be implementing um, in some way. I don't, I don't know exactly what it would look like. I mean, like, you know, jumping back to the school stuff we were talking about earlier, <laughs> maybe, maybe we just, just you know, Bingo. teach it. <laughs> Bingo. So <laughs> crazy. Yeah. But I, I don't know. Those are, those are some ideas. And, and looking around the country, there hasn't been anybody that's been like, oh, mm -hmm. this is the solution. Yeah, because, so. I mean, it sounds like a lot of philanthropic work, honestly. And if you can't directly make money off of it, a lot of people aren't going to try. Yeah. 
unfortunately. Yeah. But ultimately, I feel like this is going to be one of those things where a uh, dedicated um, city head is going to see that and be like, I think this is a decent solution we can work towards. Yeah, hopefully. Hopefully. Fingers crossed. <laughs> I might be asking a lot. But it's government after all. Yeah. Uh, but speaking of government, somebody in government made a really big uh-oh uh, recently, here in Fort Worth even. Okay. So Fort Worth is looking to move their city hall. Um, they back... In 2021, they actually bought the Pier 1 uh, Imports headquarters. Yes, yeah, it's one of the coolest looking buildings. Of it is pretty cool looking, yeah. yeah. And it's, it's right over there by Clear Fork off of the uh, Trinity River. Beautiful view, everything. Um, so they... Uh, I thought it was downtown, not Clear Fork. Uh, they said it was going to be uh, in the... I think I think they said the Tr- Clear Fork area. I'd double ch- I'll double check the or- article, but it's somewhere along the Trinity river i do know that because okay. that's very relevant to okay. what we're about to talk about okay yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> either way all right i'm with you so the uh one of the additions or a couple of the additions that they were going to make to the building was a council chamber for whenever they hold council and stuff mm-hmm. like that mm-hmm. as well as a larger parking lot and so what they did whenever they went into the planning phase for all this they uh hired radican title and at radican title did their due diligence hired a survey company to go out there draw the lines and everything figure out where it was because it was so close to the river they knew they were in a flood plain but they just needed to know exactly where everything was mm-hmm. and so they saw that the flood uh the flood way itself was beyond where they were planning to build they're like okay cool let's draw all our designs around this mm-hmm. so they go through that and then um very recently i have an idea where this is yeah <laughs> very recently they um so they pulled the, so just forewarning they pulled this survey from public records and they were estimate lines and that's fairly normal like whenever you're whenever you're pulling a, a survey and you need to make an update to it a lot of times they'll just take the information for the past past uh, survey plot it together and then make any new additions or changes that they need to uh, basically what ended up happening is at some point during there a difference of opinion happened between surveyors and those estimate lines got moved around quite a bit because whenever they came into because in project planning they take uh, steps and as they reach certain checkpoints they'll stop reevaluate where the money is and like Mm -hmm. what they can do whenever they were doing one of those meetings they basically sat the survey down the surveyor took a pen drew the line where the flood way actually is and it went right through the building oh geez yeah so the projected city council or council room half of it is basically bisected by where this floodway is and it completely covers the entire parking lot Mm. so their hundred million dollar project just went up 7.6 million dollars and got pushed back a year and a half uh (laughs) so the first surveyor was like ah it's around here Oh, the first. So the original survey that they went off of back in. So the the floodway was actually an easement that they set up back in 1957, whenever yeah. they were originally developing the area, and then the estimates were based off of that. Mm, and so okay, okay, okay. the they didn't go back far enough. They used one of the more recent ones because you know recent data is going to be generally more accurate. But sure. in this case, that wasn't something that they that they had updated or done recent research and actually surveyed properly Ah. so whenever those estimates came out and were just completely off yeah yeah it screwed them so they're they're gonna have to completely not only are they gonna have to redesign the building itself as well as the parking they also have to because they're deeper in the flood plain than they thought so is this gonna be like an attachment to the current building yeah so if you're if you're looking at it um it's it looks like a little almost like a, a rotunda or like a round office kind of thing okay. that sticks off the side towards the river. Yeah. And then there's like a pie shaped uh, parking lot that's just beyond it. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. And uh, so not only are they going to have to completely redesign the building, they're also going to have to redesign or uh, change what type of materials that they're going to be using considering its risk of flooding mm-hmm. in the area. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it just spiked. I'm just Plus like, insurance man. insurance is going to go up on yeah, the building. Well, and... At the grand opening, whenever they wow. cut the red ribbon, I guarantee there's going to be an engineer's head on a spike next to yeah. it <laughs> wow so that's uh i thought you were going to say that fema changed the floodplain no it, yeah it hasn't actually changed recently okay because that does happen and i've seen um this actually happened in a neighborhood right next to mine mm-hmm. there was like a floodway that went through there and fema reassessed and basically drew a bigger mm-hmm. area. So it pulled a bunch of these houses that weren't in the floodplain. Yeah. And now all of a sudden they've got to pay for flood insurance. And when they sell it, the next person has to pay, pay for flood insurance. And if you're not familiar with this, if it's it's not cheap. It's going to add probably at least the 
70, 80, 90, a hundred dollars to your monthly payment. Yeah. And, and it so, can be a make or break for some people. Yeah. So a lot of times if you think about it, you're going to end up selling your house for less because the mm -hmm. market's going to have to absorb that cost. So anyways, it's, it's a whole thing. And there's, and there, and then there's other places where FEMA hasn't reassessed it and Ooh, they should. It's dangerous. I went and looked at a house in Everman mm -hmm. and it was like, there was water damage somewhere or whatever. And I was asking the owner about it and it was, it was an investment deal. And he goes, Oh yeah. Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. It floods like once a year here. And I'm like, <laughs> Oh my gosh, that's not a problem. Yeah. And so anyways, it's crazy. Cause like, uh, rivers are like living things and we mm -hmm. actually spend an insane amount of money keeping the, a river's trajectory where it is in a lot of places like the, Missis the Mississippi river. Mm -hmm. We spend an ungodly amount of money just making sure it doesn't change course in a way that's going to completely undermine the economy of everything along the Mississippi, that makes sense. which is a lot. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. So anyways, flood plans. Fun stuff. Look out. Yeah. <laughs> Be sure. Be sure. But uh, as always, if you guys have any comments, suggestions, or anything for the podcast, we'd love to hear them. And if you're looking to buy or sell, we'd love to hear from you as well. So anyways, uh, that's all we got for today. And until next week, stay cool. <laughs>